Welcome to the Street Park Connection with Tommy. This video is on your spoilers for SmackDown, main event, results, and some birthdays and whatever else I can find. Of course, uh, some uh, updated uh, Superstars matches. Uh, of course, uh, thanks to uh, Curtis Thompson, Brian Witt, and Richard Browers. Uh, the, we're at the Raw Show in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Set the results for the Superstars taping. R-Truth defeated Darren Young. Layla and Natalya defeated Cameron and Naomi. Are the Funkadactyls heels? They sure acted like it. And Rich noted that both matches were fun, but standard. Curtis Thompson also attended Monday's Raw in Grand Rapids, Michigan. and set the following report on the Dark, ma dark Match Man event. John Cena defeated right back in a tables match to retain the WWE Championship. Cena sure got a lot of pops today. At one point, Ryback right flipped the table for no reason. A table was lying against the turnbuckle for a long time. Eventually, Cena reversed position and used the attitude adjustment to drive Ryback right through the table for the win. Ryback right must have found a late night doctor to give him medical clearance, as they stated on Raw that he was not medically cleared to wrestle on the Raw TV show. Mm -hmm. And there's uh, second report after Monday's Raw went off the air, John Cena defeated Ryback right in a tables match to retain the, uh, the title. And again, again, it was lying. The, the table was lying across the, the turnbuckle, and eventually Cena reversed the hold, then used the attitude adjustment to, to drive him through the table. Ric Flair and Roddy Piper are their respective families. Will appear on Celebrity Wife Swap on Sunday, June the 30th. On ABC, Flair will be sending his girlfriend, Wendy, to live on Roddy Piper's Portland, Oregon ranch, while Piper will send wife Kitty to Flair's home in Charlotte, North Carolina. And you can read the full press release on this website right here. That'll be flashing across the screen when I do the video. So many jokes, little time. Former WWE star McFoley has already, been, already appeared on the show, but he swapped lives with actor Antonio Sabato Jr., not not another wrestling star. And here's the other results. Thanks to Mike Cheyenne attended uh, Raw from Rapid, uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan. And sent a more detailed report. R-Truth did, did defeat Darren Young. As Truth got a great reaction, although he had no idea of how much it was. Or will be for the uh, being his first time. Or the first wrestler, wrestler out. And Layla and Natalia did defeat the Funkadactyls. Only one to get the reaction was Natalia, who seemed rather popular, and the match was confusing because it suggested tension between the Funkadactyls and Natalia, which was unclear to the live crowd. Uh, let my buddy know that this is the Shreveport Connection. <laughs> the weekly webcast of uh, wrestling events. Mm-hmm. And they said the dark match main event for tonight's uh, SmackDown taping is li listed as Sheamus, R Randy Orton, and Chris Jericho versus The Shield in a six-man tag action. And pro wrestling legend Bruiser Brody, a.k.a. Fra Frank Goodish, was born on this date, 1946. He died July 17, 1988, when he was stabbed to death backstage at a World Wrestling Council event by wrestler and booker Jose Gonzalez. I guess they had some type of fight. And he worked as invader number one. Gonzalez was initially charged with first-degree murder, but it was later reduced to involuntary homo homicide. Several wrestlers re uh, declined to testify. I guess their jobs were threatened on the line back in the day. And yes, that was a day of world-class championship wrestling when they were the most popular on the block. Yeah, uh, Von Erich's history. Okay, late uh, Japanese pro wrestler, legend Mitsuharu Misawa was born on this date, 1962. He died June 13, uh, 2009, after losing consciousness during a tag team match, and he was pronounced dead in the hospital. Misawa's family declined to release the details of the autops autopsy report. The late Trent Acid, a uh, former backyard wrestler, a.k.a. Michael Verdi, died on this date, 2010, of drug overdose. Popular combat zone wrestler, regular, was arrested earlier that year for possession of heroin. So, take that and put it together. That's the way I got it. Former WWE wrestler Vito LaGrasso turned 49 years old today. Or actually, uh, he was uh, June 18th, three or four days ago, whenever I copied the results. 
What a birthday. Uh, he was born 1964 on June 18th. No pro wrestling shows for this week were posted for ESPN Classic. Diva Dirt interview with Anya, a.k.a. Anna Boga Mothla. I don't even know how to pronounce that myself. Bogo Moza Ova. That was spelled. And you can uh, go to divadirt.com for that on her release from WWE Developmental. I wish I had known it was coming. I always asked my coaches what to work on, but they always told me I was doing well. Honestly, I wish I had an idea that it might come, but I didn't. For now, I need to take a break until I heal, but I'm always open to opportunities and do MMA or wrestling. On joining WWE, I sent my resume out to WWE. It wasn't a huge, I wasn't a huge fan. But I love the show and always wanted to try something new in my sports career. And wrestling seemed like a lot of fun. And I wanted to try it. They called me back within a day and asked me to train in Tampa. And I fell in love after five days. This is definitely something I wanted to do in my life. Being NXT's powerhouse diva, of course, I mean, come on. I'm six foot one, much bigger than all the other divas. My character was pretty much who I am. I have a strong accent and I can't hide it. I'm much bigger than the other girls, and it was who I am. I tried different variations, but it was also e always easy to be myself. They asked me to speak more Russian. My character is pretty much who I am. I loved it and still love it. So I guess she wasn't able to do the Maurice kind of character. NXT has become the most consistently entertaining weekly TV produced by WWE, as well as a very... Promising developmental territory for the future of WWE to learn, grow, and improve their act. Performers such as the S.H.I.E.L.D. members of uh, like Seth Rollins, Big E. Langston, who's not in the S.H.I.E.L.D., the Wyatt family, Husky Harris, and his followers, have all found success in NXT, leading to promotions to the main roster. This article is a scouting report of, of the talent in NXT as of June 2013. The 10 numbered acts are the most heavily featured acts on NXT, excluding the aforementioned WWE call-ups ranked by the percentage of their potential. A new crop of talent is set to come in starting in July. So look for, uh, for this article to be semi-regular piece on ProWrestling.net. That's where I copied it from. Number one guy coming in, Leo Kruger, a South African native that was born uh, uh, brought up in the business with Justin Gabriel under Gabriel's father, Paul Lloyd Sr., but bears no resemblance in, in any fact of his work. He's had a uh, reduced presence since the dissolution of his team with Cassius Ono, but has shown loads of ready-to-go potential. His maniacal alpha male character brings in an edge and unpredictability that may that make him very compelling to follow. His character fits his personality, which uh, fits his ring work and his promo style. Commentators have a tendency to take his character a bit over the top and phony, but Leo can really shine as a, a dastardly heel when he's portrayed as a legitimate threat. He's a triple, uh, triple H favorite who at times runs the risk of falling into the boring methodical category. That being said, it's, he's a uh, technically sound, smart wrestler who aggressively works body parts that sets up his finish. His character may be a victim of being cartoonish under the wrong creative plans or poor dissection or depiction. Uh, but if handled properly, Kruger could be a very successful star in WWE. And here's the pros about him to find a character that is an extension of himself and fits his entire on-screen act. And here's what's against him. Matches can be tedious in the lower gears. And the number two guy is Cassius Ono. Ono is a world travel student of pro wrestling. The former Chris Hero has trained and taught in schools, camps, and dojos across the U.S., Europe, and Japan. Working with some of the best who has ever lived, Ono has uh, took full advantage of the opportunity to work a program with Mentor, William Steven Regal and put on one of the, if not, the best matches seen on the NXT. He showed outstanding ca capability as a threatening, slightly unhinged villain. He has been a constant player on NXT, but he has been subject to being placed in a thrown together tag team. First with Leo Kruger, 
and now with Corey Graves. He used great spots and maneuvers from all corners of the wrestling world that haven't been seen in WWE and help him to stand out as a worker. Ono is going to be an interesting case to follow. As an on-screen and in-ring act could be a huge hit. He's also relatively undefined as a persona. This is what he's got going for him, a well-traveled ring general whose work is always entertaining. And this is what is against him. He has yet to show equal promo character capabilities as a babyface as much as he does with his heels character. Number three, who I was just speaking about, Corey Graves. He's under, undersized, underrated, and often underappreciated, much like any of the stars in current roster of WWE. Has a unique tattoo grunge, almost steampunk uh, steam look and style about him. Some will draw obvious visual comparisons to CM Punk, but the similarities stop at the tattoos. He has his catchphrase, stay down, tattooed across his knuckles. I guess you got to stay down. Okay, uh, which he often incorporates into very premeditated, fluid, and compelling promos. Graves is small, but holds his own physically and works a submission heavy style. And he's been featured prominently on NXT, having earned several shots at the number one contendership, but never feeling like a legitimate threat to win the title. He is currently teaming with Cassius Ono in what feels like a temporary but unnecessary hold, holding spot against the Wyatt family. His matches are always logical and solid, even when he's uh, not fe uh, doesn't feel entirely relevant. He's not someone I foresee becoming a top player, but there is a place for him without a doubt. Here's what's going for him, a deliberate and smooth on the mic with a ring style that can be similarly described. What's against him being perceived as CM Punk Jr. may hinder him and his ability to get over. Number four, Paige. Paige is consistently one of the most over performers on the NXT and only 20 years old. She's always, she already looks very comfortable in the ring and has a firm handle on her anti-diva character and personality. She comes from an English wrestling family led by matriarch Saraya Knight and father Ricky Knight. The mother-daughter duo most notably worked together in Shimmer where Paige was able to gain some U.S. indie experience before joining WWE. Paige is definitely a small, but her appeal, charisma, and work won't let, let her size hold her back. Potentially, Paige and AJ Lee could have an incredibly le legacy of matches unlike anything we've seen from the women in mainstream U.S. wrestling. What's going, going, what's going for her is a unique, ultra-appealing diva with more than capable in-ring work. Once against her, she's uh, only 20 years young and untested living life on the road. And number five, Sami Zayn. Uh, Sami has, has an intangible, endearing, genuine charisma that makes him come across as being extremely relatable. He's the newest uh, single star to debut in NXT and picked up victories over Kurt Hawkins and Antonio Cesaro on his uh, very first night. In his interview, Sami shows an innate likability and instant connection with whomever he is inter interacting with. He is able to get cla uh, got, got classy yet flirty when talking to Renee Young and show intensity, passion, and confidence in his ongoing feud with Cesaro. He has worked all around the globe, gaining experience and building a lo loyal fan base, so his work will look very familiar to many fans of independent wrestling. His unique Hybrid of Lucha Libre and main event styles make him an exciting and very memorable. He is a scrawnier than most anyone on the WWE roster, but his strong underdog work and untouchable babyface fire make him an incredibly promising prospect. What's going for him is indescribably genuine personality with standout potential in all areas. What's bad for him? Far from the body guy WWE has been known to favor. Number six, Adrian Neville. No, not the singer. Uh, this, the thing Adrian Neville is capable of doing on the, off the top rope are absolutely spectacular, but many of the high flyers are. He has been primarily featured in championship tag teams with Oliver Gray and Bo Dallas. So he has yet to show his full potential as a singles act. Prior to signing with WWE, Neville spent 
extensive time working in Japan with some of the most stellar athletes in the wrestling world. He proved to be one of the best junior heavyweights in the sport during his runs with Dragon Gate, both in Japan and the U.S. Unfortunately, his star potential he is he is as poor on the mic as he is incredible in the ring. His interviews are awkward and seems uncomfortable having the camera on him when he, when he isn't wrestling or flying. Improve acting or public speaking classes would do wonders for the uh, timid young man with a heavy heavy Gordy accent. Or oh, Jordy. Uh, his career uh, will be a tug of war between his struggles on the mic and his remarkable in ring prowess. But does a Jeff Hardy have the same thing? Was going good for him, breathtaking aerialist with a great WWE physique. Was bad for him, a self-admitted and lack of confidence makes his charisma and speaking capability questionable. Number seven, Emma, last nameless. Emma is a talented worker and has a po uh, polarizing quirky act. The last storm trainee has won the affection of NXT crowd with her lovable, obvious, oblivious, ditzy character. And even more so with her bizarre dance and incredibly catchy entrance theme. When her music hits, the arena comes to life and springs into a really fun atmosphere where almost everyone is able to let loose and dance along with her. Her work, her work in the ring is solid technically, but she also stays true to her character, which brings a lighthearted, almost comedy aspect to her, to her matches. She runs the risk of falling into the bad Santino territory with the goofiness Especially if her character falls into the hands and brains of someone who doesn't have a good bearing on what to do with her. Her act is enjoyable, entertaining, and works in appropriate doses. But it's unclear how she would come across on a bigger stage at this point. What's going good for her, her dance, music, and personality will stick in your head. What's bad is the act will naturally grind the gears of people who don't like silly comedy dumb blonde stereotypes, or epic dancing. Well, number eight, Conor O'Brien, the rat face from NXT. Uh, competition, a guy with a great size, quickness, power, and the most elaborately produced character in, in NXT, Conor O'Brien, may be the next supernatural star, or, or may he may not even get off the ground. His act is up under underworld theme and runs the risk of losing Believability, and especially with the name of as disconnected from the act as Conor O'Brien, he has all the gifts that he, he can be given both naturally and co cosmetically. But it remains to be seen if he can make his act connect and work in a more modern era of wrestling. He also has yet to show that he can be he can put out good in ring work and consistent on a consistent basis. He shows hints of getting it but isn't always as entertaining as, as he should be with the experience. Having spent an extensive time in developmental, he is inconsistently featured on NXT TV, occasionally portrayed as a legitimate threat, or other times se seeming, seeming aimless. His pairing with a now-released Kenneth Cameron showed promise as the Ascension, and his apparent... Recent pairing with Rick Victor in a similar gimmick was also potential of view if used appropriately. What's going what was what is going for him is physically gifted and ultra unique gimmick. What's bad for him is inconsistently featured. Inconsistent matches. Oh, and who names uh, an evil underworld character on our plan? Number nine, Bo Dallas, without a doubt, the reigning NXT champion is the most unbearable baby face in all of WWE. <coughs> yeah, including John Cena. He is what JR would call a blue chipper and can go in the ring, but he also has tremendous go away heat from the NXT crowd. He is often met with heavy boos and berated with chant of no more bow. The talent he has been getting bur uh, buried underneath his sappy stuck on smile and his inexplicable unlikability. His first run on WWE TV went absolutely nowhere after he failed to stand out or connect. Of late, he's been delivering lame white meat material on the mic, dusted with subtle hits, leaning heelish that the crowds happily jump all over. There is hope that 
this mega heat as a baby face will translate into a successful hill character. Otherwise, the son of an IRS, Mike Rotunda, may be in trouble. Let's go, go on for a talented in the ring performer with, a, with the sport in his blood. But what's bad for him? Nuclear go away heat from a large portion of the live, live crowd and viewers. And the bottom out the top 10, Mason Ryan, who was uh, uh, with a, with a uh, straight as Nexus type, type thing. The red flag Mason Ryan has been given multiple chances on the big stage and continues to be featured on uh, featured act on NXT. He appears as freakishly muscular as ever, um, uh, very similar to the Batista character. Uh, everybody was thinking he was Batista Jr. taking the term of body guy to a seeming, seemingly unnecessary level. His work has shown slight signs of improvement since his WWE run, but he hasn't been tested in anything more than one. Or two minute plus wins. He also hasn't been featured in any promos, vignettes, or interviews like the majority of NXT performers are, leaving him as undefined, as vague as he was in the new Nexus. The guy has an incredible build, but the wrestling business seems to be moving away from the pure body type guys, especially when such size is a hindrance to work ability. I don't think Mason Ryan will cut it in the WWE system over the long run, but the matchmakers in NXT apparently have yet to realize that. What's good for him is the impressive physique that makes him stand out in an era where more little guys are featured in getting over. And what's bad for him, poor work, poor character, and proof that WWE wellness policy doesn't catch it everything. Other names to keep in mind, Enzo Amore. And in an in era clamoring for the return of career jobbers, Amore has the ability to be an awesome one. He talks a million miles per hour and portrays himself as a tough guy, calling himself the realest guy in the room. He is able to walk walk to the ring with a microphone, draw great heat, and make a baby face look like a star while shutting him up. It's not the career hope. The career one hopes for, but it's a necessary position that could use some solid players like Amore. Scott Dalton and Garrett Dylan, or Dylan expect to see more of those two, but don't expect it to be high-flying quality, high quality entertainment. This cartoonish red, redneck act with their French high roller manager, Sylvester Laporte, has a very small chance of, of ever connecting with the crowds of, of viewers, or, or viewers, the way you're being booked gives the impression management sees something and wants to give them a shot, but I don't see a bright future for either if the duo doesn't seriously improve from week one. Xavier Woods, formerly known as Consequences Creed, he's my favorite in the whole, even in the top ten. He's been seen, like I said, uh, in, uh, formerly in TNA. Woods comes in with high charisma and great pot potential in the ring along with a great physique. His gimmick is a true-to-life 90s kid act, which may or may not find success connecting with an audience, whole or, or niche, or niche. The soon-to-be PhD has yet a heavily featured, other than forgettable win several months ago, but expect him to see uh, to uh, expect to see him get a chance to show his stuff. Carla Cassidy, Cassidy has only made one appearance on NXT TV, losing in his debut in a squash match to Mason Ryan. However, the guy is tall, has really good athletic size, and genuinely looks like a pro wrestler. He hasn't had the opportunity to show much yet, but his sole appearance gave him the impression that he has the potential to be repackaged into an act that will work him and make him help him advance. Rebecca Knox. The yet to debut, Rebecca Knox is someone who will be completely hit or miss. She has a history of injury that has caused her to miss substantial in ring time and take a toll on her career thus far. This paints her as the injury prone type who may not be long for the wrestling business. That being said, she, all, she is also a trainee of New Japan's most impressive rising star, Fergal Pritt. De uh, Debit. It is because of his name, value, and skills that I could uh, potentially see her coming in and helping to bump up the image of women, women's wrestling in, in WWE or continue the strengthening of NXT's female roster. 
And the update of uh, Richie Steamboat, he's been out of action for seven months with a back injury and it has seemingly been forgotten on NXT TV. According to multiple reports, the injury was serious enough that there was a legitimate concern as to whether or not his career would continue. He is scheduled to undergo back surgery in the near future, according to Dave Meltzer, and there was no timetable set for his return. Oliver Gray, the last man in the, in the mentioning, a UK native, was formerly one half of the first ever NXT Tag Team Champions with Adrian Neville. He has been out of action since mid-February due to a torn ACL. He has since had a surgery to replace his ACL ligament and remove almost half of his meniscus. When the injury first occurred, he was projected to miss six to eight months. We expect to see him back towards the end of 2013 if all goes according to plan. And now for your main event taping. From Toledo, Ohio, results courtesy of PW Torch, very brief. Primetime players defeated the Tongues of Funk in, in the dark match. And the first match, the Shield versus the Uso Brothers. And just a game of the six-man tag. Okay, the Shield won against them. And Antonio Cesaro with Zeb Coulter. The faction has started. Defeated Sin Cara. And your main event was Caitlyn defeating Oksana. Oksana was looking great in her, in her match. A little bit better than the following week, the previous week. And your SmackDown tapings. Thus, I only got one report for the entire week. Okay, from Toledo, Ohio, courtesy of PW Torch, Daniel Bryan opened with a promo. Randy Orton interrupted and said, set up their, mat, their main event match, replacing the advertised Bryan versus Dean Ambrose. Okay, first match, Seamus defeated Cody Rose. Second match, Curtis Axel defeated Wade Barrett to retain the Intercontinental title. Match number three, Diva Champion AJ defeated Natalya. Match number four, Alberto Del Rio defeated Chris Jericho by disqualification when Dolph Ziggler interfered. And Christian defeated Drew McIntyre. The Shield attacked, uh, attacked Christian afterwards. And your main event was Daniel Bryan. Daniel Bryan was defeated by Randy Orton, I guess. It says Daniel Bryan by Randy Orton by countout. And no main event. Dark match, unless I said it earlier. The results. Well, again, uh, thanks for viewing, and uh, peace out. Uh, we'll be getting your... TNA results as soon as I can. Thanks again and peace out.